Leave your Bibles open to 1 John. That's where we're going to be this morning. That's a departure from where we've been, as you know. We've been in the book of Proverbs, and we will be back to Proverbs here in just a few weeks. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to be at Shiprock for our Saturday Bible study on the reservation, and I had asked Bob, who's the preacher there, you know, what subject they wanted to hear, and he said, we need to learn about love. And so those are the lessons that I presented yesterday were on love and had a couple of people tell me afterwards, we need to know more about love. And I think that's true. I think we need to speak about love as often as we can. I had already decided that the camp session that I direct in the summer is about love. Love me do. I had to work a Beatles lyric in there. Those of you that know me know I work that way. Uh, but we're going to be talking about love this summer. And so I'd already planned on spending basically now between spring break and June working up the material for that uh, camp. And so I had the thought yesterday, I want us to talk about love here. And so I'm kind of do, doing double duty for a bit as I work toward camp and some of the lessons I want to do there, and then drawing off some of the lessons that I presented yesterday. Uh, so I hope that you'll, you'll humor me in that. Uh, we will be back to Proverbs soon, though, I promise, um, and this will give me a little bit more time to work on some of those lessons. But today I do want us to think about love. You know, love is such an interesting word, at least in English. We use that word in a lot of different ways. I want you to think about ways that you have spoken that word this week. Hopefully you said to your spouse, I love you, or to your child, I love you, or to, to your parent, I love you. But usually in the same breath, we'll also say something like, well, I love Eric Clapton, if you're me. Or I love my vehicle, or I love my sports team, or I love this, or I love that. Now, as we say that in those different contexts, we obviously mean different things. I don't love Eric Clapton like I love Nancy. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> she knows I like music. So we know what we mean usually when we say, I love you. You know, the context determines that. Uh, but I think we're kind of at a disadvantage in the way our language is. I want to share with you a couple of quotes. Uh, this is from a, a writer named Bell Hooks. It says, we use the word love in such a sloppy way that it can mean almost nothing or absolutely everything. I think you would agree with that. Here's another quote from Arund Hatai Roy. I don't know who this is, but... He says, I use the word love loosely and only because my vocabulary is unequal to the task of describing the precise nature of that maze, that forest of feelings. You know, love is such a simple word, it's four letters. And again, we can use it in so many different ways, but it does either have a very depth of meaning or something that really doesn't mean a whole lot. Again, it's about context and the way that we use it. But English is kind of unique. There are many other languages of the world that have many different terms for the word love. And I think that's helpful because it helps us understand exactly what we're saying. And that is true of the Bible languages. Hebrew for the Old Testament, Greek for the New Testament. Both of those languages had multiple words for love. I want to share with you some of those words this morning. Uh, the first one was the word ahav. And this was the basic word for love in Hebrew. Uh, but it was a word that had more meaning than we usually attach to just basic love. Uh, it's a word that stood for the feelings of attractions uh, to and goodwill toward another person. And it was a very sincere emotion of love toward another person. It wasn't merely just butterflies in the stomach. Uh, it was a depth of feeling for a person and even a, a committed feeling for a person. Uh, that was the word ahav. Another word in Greek, or not Greek, but Hebrew for love is dode. 
And this is not a verb, it's actually an adjective, a word of description, a word that describes intimacy shared with another person. Um, this is the word in the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, that is translated as beloved. And so it's a title or an adjective. Um, Dode wasn't lust, though. I think sometimes we assume that when we hear the word beloved, it's a pure love. It's really a desire to give pleasure and to bless as much as it is to receive. And so, in a very sincere way, it is this idea of my beloved. That's the word dod. Another Hebrew word is ahava. This is the word in Hebrew for lustfulness. This is the idea of a sexual love, a desire to have another. Uh, this is a word that's really all about self-gratification. Interestingly, this is the word in Hebrew culture in the Old Testament that's used of idolatry and how somebody gives themselves over to a false god. This is the word that is used in those situations. Another word in Hebrew is raham. This is a word for mercy and compassion, the action of being good to another person, being loving toward another person especially somebody that was in need. So raham is a very positive word for love. And then a fifth word for love, and you'll notice I have this in, in bigger type because I want you to remember this word. This is the word hesed. Sometimes you'll see it spelled in English as C-H-E-S-E-D. The C is silent, but hesed. This is a word that means loving kindness or a love that's described as being steadfast and lasting. This is a word that's used of God in the Old Testament many times. We're familiar with the words of Lamentations chapter 3. We sing a song from verse 22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies come true or come new every morning. Uh, that word that's used of God, the steadfast love of God, is this word hesed. It's a love that does not end. It's a love that continues to go on. Uh, it's a word, interestingly enough, that has a, a root meaning in the idea of a, a man with a long nose. In Semitic culture, Jewish culture, the thought of having a long nose meant that you were a patient person that you put up with a lot. Maybe the insults directed at your way because of your big nose. And so that, that idea is behind this idea of hesed. It's the idea of a patient love, a love that puts up with a lot, but it's also the idea of a love that's unmerited. Uh, one that is showing hesed is not loving because you're getting something in return. That's normally what we think of in relationships. We think of, of them as reciprocal. You bless me, I bless you. You love me, I love you. That's how the world operates. Hesed's much different. Hesed is a personal choice to love despite what the other person may think. So a very powerful word. Those are the five words that you'll find in Hebrew. There are actually a few more that are used in Hebrew culture as well for the idea of love, but those are the basic words. Now to turn the page to the Greek. The Greek also uses a few words for love, and there's four primary words, and these are words that you're going to be more familiar with. We have the word phileo. You know of the city of Philadelphia. We call Philadelphia the city of brotherly love. Well, it's built on this word phileo and also the word delpho uh, for the word city or town. Um, phileo is the idea of friendship love or brotherly love. It's the affection that we show uh, and goodwill that we show toward those that are close. But this is a reciprocal kind of love. That's usually how our friendships are. We're friends with people because either they're similar to us or they benefit us in some way and we benefit them. We have similarities with them, so it's a back and forth. That's what this phileo is. Usually it's a very sincere type of love. You know, I love you as my friend, literally, because of what you mean to me and how you bless me in my life. And so it can be a, a very good type of love. At the heart of phileo is the idea of devotion. 
being devoted to a friend, the idea of being loyal to a friend. Uh, it's also a term that can be used at times with families, but it's more of the idea of, of uh, friends and the goodwill we show toward them. Another word in Greek is the word storge. This is similar to phileo, uh, but this is a, the, the word that's used in families. You know, as a parent, I love my daughters. My daughters love me, I hope. As a brother, you love your sister and vice versa. It's really based on that kinship that you share. And because of that kinship, storge is really an expected love. You know, you're born into a family. It's not something that you choose to be, but you're born into that family. And with that, you share not only just DNA, but you also share love. It's an innate love. We love because, now at times, you know, our families can get a little difficult and maybe it's hard to love our brother or our sister or our children or our parents, but that love is still there and it can be rekindled at times. That's the word storge. Then we have the word eros, and I'm sure you've heard that word uh, as a verb for love, but we also think maybe of the God of love, eros, as he's known during uh, Valentine's time of the year we hear about Eros, he's the one with the, the bow and arrow uh, that we often mythologize about love and so forth. Uh, eros is the, the love of sexuality in Greek. It's also the love of lustfulness in Greek. Uh, it can be a very positive thing if it's in a proper context. You know, as husbands, we are to love our wives in the form of Eros. Um, but the word can also be used in some bad context. Sadly, more often than not, that's where this word has been used. And we'll talk more about that next week. But that's eros. Then we have a word that I think probably everybody will know, or at least you've heard, and that is the Greek word agape. Now, that is the word that writers in Scripture, that the teachers of the gospel begin to use, because it's a word that Jesus uses. It's a word that's used of God. In fact, the words that Jovi read for us earlier from 1 John declare that God is agape. God is love. Uh, this word was around well before Christianity. It's an ancient word. But interestingly enough, it wasn't used a lot in Greek culture. It really begins to be used with frequency with Christians. And... It's almost to the point we call this Christian love. I call it godly love because, again, God is agape. God is love. This is a love that's different than phileo and storge. You know, phileo is the love of friendship. You choose your friends based on kinship that you have, similarities that you have, interests that you have, personalities that you share. You choose that love. Storge, again, is the love of family. It's that innate love that you have for your brother or your sister. And those are based on some rational thing. Agape could be described as irrational love because it's a lot like the Hebrew love that I mentioned earlier, hesed. It's a love that's chosen despite. In other words, you love agape because love is of value to you. It's because of who you are. It's not because of the other person. Maybe that other person is unlovable in the human sense, but we love despite that. That's what agape is, and we're going to more fully develop what agape means over the next few weeks, because again, it is that godly love. It's that love we're called to have, because not only is God is love, God is agape, we're told that we must love one another as God has loved us. And it is this agape that we're talking about. Yesterday I asked the audience that I was with, which was mostly Navajo, is, is there more than one word in Navajo for love? And uh, what I learned is there's one basic word, and it's ayo, uh, which means love. The phrase there at the top is, is um, I love you, basically. Uh, you can use that word ayo in different contexts, and so it'll look different, but that's the basic word. And so it's much like English. In other languages, I think more modern languages, and by modern I mean post-antiquity, you know, 
post-Greek and Hebrew and Latin, the modern languages are more isolated in, in our wording, more precise in our wording, and so there's fewer words. Well, let's go to 1 John. That's where we're going to spend our time this morning, the words that were read earlier for us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. If you've not memorized those verses, you need to. And they're easy verses to memorize because one word in particular is repeated often. We have a song that we sing from these words, and uh, maybe we can get that into the rotation over the next few weeks to sing it. But 1 John 4, 7 and 8 tells us, Dear friends, let us love. That's the Greek word agape. Let us love one another for love. Again, the word agape comes from God. Everyone who loves, again, the word agape has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love, again, that's agape, does not know God because God is love. God is agape. What a wonderful declaration that is. You know, the beginning of love, that's what I've titled this. The beginning of love is simple. It's God. That's where love is defined. This agape love we're talking about, that's where this, this love can be learned. It's through God. And so that's what we're going to do this morning is I want us to think about the love of God. And we see God's love in, in many different ways. But I want to mention some very specific ways this morning about God's love. Now we've already said a couple of things about how agape is this chosen love. It's a love that really isn't deserved by the one that is being loved. Because that's really not what this is about. The love that we're talking about originates from us as we love another person. It's because of who we are. And I truly believe it's because we begin to see, as God sees, how all people are of value. Because at the heart of this, at the heart of God's love, is his love for all of mankind. We can all quote John 3.16, For God so loved the world. It doesn't say, for God so loved a few, for God so loved this specific people. It says, for God so loved the world. That's everyone. I think that's everyone that's ever lived on this planet. You know, today there's about 8 billion people that live on earth. Uh, the, The number I've heard about people that have lived throughout time is about 36 billion. I don't know how that's ever been determined, but if that's accurate, think about it. 8 billion of that 36 billion are alive at this moment kind of says something about the history of of the world and mankind. God has loved every one of us. And I don't believe that's just in some generic way where God says, oh, I love you, kind of like we say, I love you to people. I think God's love is a personal love. It's directed at each one of us. Sadly, it's a love that, that many don't know, don't recognize, don't accept, but that doesn't change the fact that God loves you. For God so loved the world. Of course, the rest of that phrase really defines what that love is. And when we get into 1 John again, he's going to tell us that love was shown by him sending his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's the pure act of love that we'll talk about. I want to look at a few other places, though, before we get there. Look at Romans chapter 5. I won't have the words here on the screen. But Romans chapter 5 <clears throat> gives us a glimpse of God's love. This is chapter 5, verse 8. It says, But God demonstrates his own love, that's the word agape, for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now John 3 16 is for God so loved the world that he gave his son. Here in Romans, Paul is a little bit more precise when he says that God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, God sent his son. Think about that. That really emphasizes the idea of how this agape love from God to us is unmerited. While we were enemies, and actually that's the wording in Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says while we were estranged from God, and the word there in Greek means we were enemies with God, God sent Jesus. That's pretty extraordinary. 
you know, again, the world loves in a way that's reciprocal. You, know, you benefit me, you bless me, uh, you love me, and I'll be glad to love you. That's how the world conditions us. You know, that's based on a transaction. With God, that's not how love is. God initiates the love. Even while we were away from God, enemies with God, maybe even unaware of God, maybe even cursing God. God loved us. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. I reference chapter 2 where he says that while we were still strange, back to chapter 1, those of you that are here a lot, you know I like these two verses we're going to look at. Verse 4 and 5 of Ephesians 1, For he chose us, speaking of God, in him, that's Jesus, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. He's saying before the foundation of the world, he loved us in Jesus, is essentially what we're being told. I've asked the question before, I'll ask it again to our parents, and that is, when did you first love your child? Imagine for each of us, it's probably a little bit different. I can still remember with my oldest, Elizabeth, who's now 24 years old, Invited into the doctor's room to uh, check out things, make sure the pregnancy was going fine. This was about three months into the pregnancy. And the doctor asked me the question, do you want to hear the heartbeat? Well, that, that question kind of took me off guard. I was new to this whole thing of parenting. I knew that in theory, I was now a parent. And that we had a child that was being developed and would be here pretty quickly, about six months down the road. But beyond that, it, it hadn't really dawned on me that I had a child. And I certainly didn't even think in terms of, okay, I can listen to the child. I can see the child. But he offered me the stethoscope and, and uh, enabled me to hear my daughter's heartbeat. Three months old in the womb. Well, that changed everything for me. It dawned on me, I, I'm now a father. Even got to see the little photograph. They had to tell me what I was looking at, the sonogram. But I was able to see her first image. I still have that picture in my office. You know, I was a father. That, that's a child I, I'm going to love. I'm going to love forever. But that love started after the fact that child was, was conceived. She was already a living being three months before that. In the womb. But notice what we're told of, of God's love for us. It happened not, not on our birthday, not even while we were in the womb. It was well before that. He says, before the foundation of the world, God loved us. That's incredible. And it's not just simply that he loved us then. It's he loved us in Jesus. And what that implies and what Ephesians will go on to tell us is that Jesus has come to save us. That connects us to chapter 2, verse 4. While we were still estranged with God, God sent his Son. In other words, God, before the foundation of the world, before he even created humanity, he knew that we would grow to disappoint him. In a way, to break his heart, to rebel against him. That's been the story of every human that's ever lived on this earth. He already knew all of that. He already knew that he would have to go to the extreme measure of his son dying for our sins. But he did it anyway. And he did it because of his love. And that love is eternal. Before the foundation of the world, God loved us. Now that's certainly not the phileo love we talked about, the love of friends. We choose that love. You know, I have friends that I love dearly, but that love didn't start until we met. And that love really didn't even start then. It, it came later. As we became friends and became closer, and now many years later, I can say, yes, I love them. Fifteen years old, I probably wouldn't have said that at all, but I do love them. Same with our families. It takes us a time to work up to that love, isn't it? You know, I have a sister a year younger, a brother five years younger. I guarantee you, when we were at home, growing up, it didn't look like we loved each other. You know, we were typical siblings. But I do love them. I don't say it nearly as often. In fact, probably I've only said it one or two times in my life. But I do love them. But that's different than agape. 
You know, eros is a love of the moment. It's the love of sexuality, again, of lust. What our eyes see, what our bodies want, comes and goes based on those feelings. It's not agape. Agape is a love that's eternal. Again, God is that love, and he says you are to love like that. So it goes back to the idea that we love people simply because they are create, uh, created by our Father. We're all children of God. And so we love each other. Again, we'll get more into that. I want to come back to the idea of God's love and say a few things that I've already said, but I want to emphasize again. That is, God's love for us is completely unmerited. In other words, we don't deserve it. There's nothing you can do to earn God's love. Now, there are ways that we can act that I think certainly honor God and show love to him, but we don't deserve his love. What God has done and what he's shown to us is unmerited. Look at Matthew chapter 5. These are words that Jesus is speaking. This is right after he says, love your enemies. And I imagine when the people heard that on the mountain, they were Amazed. How, how do you love your enemies? You, you certainly don't phileo your enemies. No, that's the love of friendship. You certainly don't storge your enemies because that's the love of family. You certainly don't eros your enemy, or at least that would be kind of bizarre. You know, that's the love of lust. Jesus says you are to agape your enemies. And then he says this. He says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people or those that, that look like you, that talk like you, that share the things you share, he says, if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? And then he says, do not even the pagans do that. In other words, he says, even the godless people, they love their friends. They love their families. They love their spouses. He says that's, those are normal. He says, though, we are to be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, he's not talking about a moral perfection here. He's talking about love. In fact, when Luke includes this little statement in his, in his gospel, it is the word love he uses. That's what Jesus was meaning. We love like God. In other words, we agape love, because that's what God is. You know, God doesn't love us because he's looking for some kind of payoff. That's the reciprocal nature. I'll love you if you love me. That's not how God operates. He doesn't love us because he's looking for a payoff or because he's expecting to be loved in return. Now, I think he has that desire to be loved in return. But he doesn't love with that in mind. That makes sense. God loves because it is who he is. Another idea of God's love is that it's steadfast. The word steadfast means it lasts. Remember the Hebrew word that I shared with you, the hesed. It's the steadfast love. Again, Lamentations 3, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end because they're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The word faithfulness is built on the word hesed. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Therefore, I will hope in him. What a beautiful song that is, and that's what we've made those words is a song that speaks of that steadfast love of God. It never ends. It's not interrupted because of anything that we do. Now, obviously, his love is shown in different ways as we believe and don't believe and obey and don't obey. But that doesn't eliminate the fact that he loves us. In fact, the tough love that he'll show us when we are misbehaving, that's a form of love. Those of us that are parents know that because we've had to show tough love to our kids. You remember what the writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews chapter 12. He talks about a father that disciplines his son. He's saying that that's what God's doing to you terms of the hardships that they're dealing with, he's saying that's love. And then he says if you don't love, if a father doesn't love, he actually hates his son. Part of that discipline is love, and we'll get more into that in the next few weeks, but I want to share with you a story 
there was a man that was down by a riverbank, and he noticed a scorpion trying to scramble across a branch over the creek bed. Well, the scorpion was having some difficulty. Difficulty. It would go a ways and then fall off. I have to get back up to the top where it could cross the water. Well, the man watched a few times as that happened, and then he decided he was going to help out. And so he began to, to reach for the scorpion every time it would fall. And you know what would happen. You know, he would touch the scorpion, the scorpion would rear back and sting it. Well, there was a, a little boy there, same scene, that was watching this, and he was amazed at what this man was doing. And finally, after several stings, he, he said to the man, he said, you realize this is a scorpion, and it's in his nature to sting you. The man thought about that for a moment, and then he said this. He says, it is my nature to love and to save. Why should the scorpion's evil nature change mine? That's at the heart of God's love. Again, it's not because of what I do or who I am. It's because of who God is. God loves us. His love is steadfast. It, it gets past those stings. Another thought about God's love is that it's not distant. Look back again at 1 John 4. We read 7 and 8 earlier. Look at verse 9. This is how God showed his love. His agape among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. God's love is not distant. Notice what we have here of God. God comes down to rescue his people, and his people are all of humanity. For God so loved the world, God came down. Jesus came into this world. You know, God could have very well kept his distance, shouted down from above, you're saved. Could have given us some instructions about what that meant. Could have kept his hands clean. That's not what God did. God stepped down. He sent his son into the world. First John, or John, rather, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, you'll recognize these words. The word, speaking of Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word in there is actually pitched his tent. He came to live in our neighborhood, right next door. Came down to us. He said, We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. God came near. Then down to verse 18 of that same chapter, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known. God's love is not distant. He came to where we are. He came to live the life that we live. Again, he could have kept his distance. That's not God. His love is not distant. It is up close. Then a fourth and final thing to think about this morning. God's love knows no boundaries. I've already quoted John 3.16 a lot this morning. For God so loved the world. Again, it wasn't just a few people he loved. It wasn't people that were obedient to him at the moment. For God so loved the world. In Ephesians chapter 2 tells us, while we were still enemies of God, he loved us. God's love knows no boundaries. He loves every human that's ever lived on this earth, despite what we've done. And again, we've seen how that love began even before any of us were. God loves his whole creation. That's amazing, isn't it? We can be awfully selective in our love, and that's what the world tells us to do. We love people that love us, or we love people that we enjoy being around, or we love people that enjoy being around us. That's what the world says happens, but that's not a God thing. We love everybody, and that presents some real challenges that we'll begin to look at over the next few weeks. Let me remind you of 1 John 4 again, 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us love, again, the word agape. That love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Then if you jump down a few verses to verses 11 and 12, 
He says, dear friends, since God so loved us, since he shared agape with us, notice we also ought to love, ought to agape one another. No one has ever seen God. That reminds us of John 1, 18 that we just read. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. and His love is made complete in us. So No one's ever seen God, but as we show love, Notice what he's saying. People see God. That, that's pretty deep, isn't it? Then he says, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. That reminds us of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's this idea here when he says God lives in us and his love is perfected or made complete in us. That's our responsibility. Share love with the world. We're going to start talking about what that means next week. We'll define not only aspects of God's love again, but we'll think about what, what does that mean for us to be agape, for us to be love in the world. Uh, you probably know where we'll look next week, 1 Corinthians 13. So read that chapter, and that's where we'll spend our time. If you're here this morning and, and have a need that you'd like to bring before our family, we would love to hear from you.